So, uh, yeah, so, um, yeah, thanks for uh, organizers here for inviting me. This, is, uh, this has been great so far. Um, I'm going to give a little bit different of a talk from some of the ones you heard today and yesterday. I do nothing related to RDF or FAIR or any of these uh, acronyms that I've been learning about uh, in the last few days. So, um, so this will be a little bit different, but uh, hopefully we can find common ground and, uh, and yeah, I'll show you what I've got. So, um, so I'm actually so I'm at the Broad Institute and Mass General Hospital in Boston in the U.S. Um, and there I work on these large aggregation projects, and particularly Exac and now Nomad. And I'll describe what those are in just a moment. So um, I consider myself something of a geneticist these days. I really think about human genetics and how what kind of data we need and what kind of data we can use to kind of solve the problems uh, facing us. And Really, I mean, I'm sure you know about the Moore's Law graphs of how cheap sequencing is getting, but I like these better, actually, the, um, the number of genomes and exomes that have been sequenced over time. And um, so the, the numbers here on this graph are the numbers from the Broad Institute itself. So this is simply at the Broad Institute, the number of genomes and exomes that have been sequenced. Um, and so, at, so by the end of, this is from late last year, the last numbers I have, but something about 60,000 genomes, a quarter of a million exomes, and you know, since this is just the Broad Institute, I think it's safe to say that there's at least this much data not at the Broad, so probably something like a half a million exomes or even at, maybe at this point even more. Um, and then 100,000 genomes probably have been sequenced uh, around the world. Um, and that's really exciting and you know, a great opportunity for, for uh, playing with this kind of data. But of course, much of this data are siloed and are not necessarily in a readily shareable form. And even if they were, uh, you know, Perhaps a, uh, one project has some data, or maybe an institution or a company. Um, and then in some cases, uh, even if you did have the data on hand, they, I mean, everyone has a, their own opinions about what pipelines are best to run. So they are somewhat inconsistently processed. So you can't always compare, compare them easily. So to tackle this problem, at least for what we could tackle this problem, we, uh, we started this exome aggregation consortium. Um, so this is uh, in Daniel MacArthur's group at the Broad. Uh, there we uh, basically got all the exomes that we could get our hands on. Uh, most of it was sequenced at the Broad, but then we also have external collaborators that, uh, that have graciously contributed data, uh, got our hands on something like 92,000 exomes, and then did a very painstaking joint processing um, and joint variant calling pipeline uh, that uh, really took a lot of effort from, uh, from some of the genomics platform groups at the Broad. Um, and from this, we were able to release something like 60,000 exomes that were high quality, unrelated individuals, consented for release, um, and th that we could. So we, we had something like 60,000 exomes, and from so many projects that are, I'm not going to name individually, but um, you can see uh, you can see on the right side some of them here. Um, so this was released something like three years ago at this point, and um, and since then, of course, we've collected more data, and so now this is what I'm suggesting that we're shifting to Nomad. Uh, where Nomad is a kind of superset of Exact to some extent, uh, minus some samples that got lost. Um, and uh, so we have something like 200,000 exomes, 20,000 genomes, uh, of which we're releasing 120,000 exomes and 15,000 genomes. Um, and as you can see, the contributing projects got even longer, um, and de definitely not reading through that. Uh, but, uh, but we are very grateful to the, the people who have uh, donated their data for this, this cause. So. What well, we can then, you know, the motivation for all this is we can actually get some novel biological insights. I won't actually talk about them here, but uh, they are published as of, uh, as of last year. Um, you can uh, go to that URL to see the publication. Um, but what I really am interested in is creating this resource for the community. So um, a, a data set that can actually be used and actually has been used actually uh, quite frequently uh, um, across the world. So um, in particular, so of course we have some constraints about what we are allowed to release and what we aren't, uh, but one thing that we are able to release is high resolution allele frequency data. So for each particular variant in the genome or in the exome, uh, what is, you know, how many individuals have been observed with that variant um, per, and then break it down by population, sex, and that kind of thing. And this is really important for clinical geneticists. So, uh, I mean, there's a growing number of individuals who are getting sequenced in the world that uh, have some rare disease, and now, their, clin their the clinicians, the clinical geneticists want to know, um, you know, where is the causal variant? Can I actually pinpoint it? And having this frequency database is actually very crucial for this because, um, you know, if, if you see the, a variant that may look scary, maybe a, a loss of function variant in, um, in some very important gene, but actually, as it turns out, it's fairly common in the population, so it's, you know, it doesn't necessarily need to be, uh, uh, you don't necessarily need to worry about it. Um, that's actually quite important. Um, 
And so we've released this data prior to publication. Both Exact was released two years before, and now Nomad has been released, even though we don't have a paper on that yet. Um, of course, we released the data dump for anyone that really wants all the data. But I actually really find it interesting that we need to um, you know, gear this also towards non-bioinformaticists to so really think what, critically what are the problems that people need to solve with this data, and how can we enable as many people as possible to do it. So to this end, we've released this exact browser. This might look familiar to some of you. Um, these, uh, these things, little blue peaks. Um, uh, the, um, and basically, the idea was here, again, to really get the data in the hands of as many people as possible, non-bioinformaticists, clinical geneticists. Um, uh, the details I'm not going to go into, but it's a very fairly, actually, lightweight um, uh, browser that uh, is, of course, publicly released open source and everything. Um, but, uh, um, but yeah, but basically, we have, I mean, we've uh, tried to really get into the minds of, like, what are the people that are going to use this tool and how are they going to use it? Um, and so there's a few questions that we can try to answer with this. For instance, I have a favorite gene. You know, what variants are found in that gene in just a healthy or relatively healthy normal population? Um, and, you know, you could uh, look up your favorite gene, click on just loss of function variants and find, okay, there's, you know, four or five loss of function variants in this gene. Um, you know, what, uh, what, what could that tell me about the biology of this gene? Is it tolerate? Is it, uh, is it, an essential gene? Is it not? That kind of, these are the kind of questions that people can answer with that. And then, of course, for the clinical geneticists, people who are thinking about, you know, I have a patient with a rare disease variant, or with a rare disease, um, I, I think this might be the cause of the disease. Is it actually, well, first of all, is the variant real? And then on top of that, is, the, uh, is it really a disease variant? So looking at uh, being able to release population frequency data, saying, okay, these, this variant has been found in hundreds of individuals and even some in the homozygous state um, and they're healthy enough to be in this population so they're, it's obviously not a causal variant. Um, but then also uh, work that was done by Ben Weisberg is actually pulling in the actual uh, short read data and actually being able to, able to observe, you know, do I believe, can I look at the reads and uh, see whether I believe this is a real variant. Um, it actually, actually has been a really popular um, uh, aspect of this tool. And then um, uh, not, uh, not only the data that is there, but then also the data that isn't there is also, I think, a really crucial uh, aspect of this is saying that, you know, given, uh, if I search for some variant or some region, it, not only is there a variant there, but also uh, is there enough data to call a variant there. So for instance, I might search for this region and say, okay, I have this variant that I'm interested in, but it's out actually outside of the where we were able to call a variant. So, you know, you'd actually want to know that information compared to you know, the absence of a variant is not necessarily the abs the actual absence. It's just yeah. um, so this data set and browser has uh, the browser actually has been used fairly extensively. Um, we have something in, since its release in 2014. We've had something over nine million page views and 400,000 users uh, as of today or yesterday when I looked this up. Um, and uh, so yeah, so uh, over time you can see the uh, trend has actually been somewhat increasing. Um, I'll get to why it's coming back down in a second. Uh, and of course, uh, if any of you are familiar with looking at these kind of plots, day-by-day -day plots, uh, you can actually see um, uh, weekends where it actually dips off um, to my annoyance. Clinical geneticists don't seem to work on weekends, so there's that. Um, and then also drops and holidays are uh, kind of apparent. But then, of course, uh, increases right before major conferences. So this is right before the um, American Society of Human Genetics Conference, so you can really see it uptick in traffic. Um, it, you, you may notice it look, appears to be going back down, but actually that's because, as I mentioned, we uh, are moving towards Nomad, um, and so the Nomad browser actually uh, uh, has, has been picking up in, uh, in popularity, and so together they're actually still increasing. It's been used by uh, nearly every country in the world. Uh, there's a few, ex few small exceptions, but um, it really is uh, um, pretty, pretty widely used. Um, and then one vignette that I can share with you is um, obviously it's mostly, you know, a lot of its usage is actually in the U.S. Um, and in the U.S. we can actually pinpoint on top of that where individuals are using the browser. Um, so of course this is highlighting some of the major uh, metropolitan areas in the, in, in the United States. Uh, of course New York, Boston, uh, Washington, D.C. Um, but uh, one thing that's actually kind of interesting about this are some regions where there's, you know, you wouldn't necessarily expect uh, that many people living in this area, but there's more browser usage than you um, than you'd expect given the population. So, for instance, this is Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, though, of course, the 
um, folks in Utah are fairly, um, uh, they are uh, very interested in human genetics. There's a lot of uh, interest there. So, and a lot of institutions that are really studying genetics. Um, but on top of that, if you can actually break this down to some extent by, um, uh, by what pages they're visiting. And you can actually see here, uh, if you limit the searches just to the, the BRCA genes, the breast cancer, BRCA1 and BRCA2, um, two cities light up, actually Salt Lake City, and then um, uh, just outside of Raleigh-Durham, North Carolina. These are the two major sequence, uh, bra breast cancer sequencing um, centers in the country. So this is Myriad Genetics is over here, and LabCorp is over here. So um, that's what we've got so far, but uh, actually the, um, the, the browser's been used extensively, uh, not only by individuals actually going and uh, looking on the browser itself, but also creating clones of it. We've had something like I think 15 already different groups and individuals asking us, can we use the browser, can we clone it? Um, and of course, we're very happy to share code and data and um, everything they need to do that. Um, and so we've had actually extensive use uh, outside of that, um, including um, some companies that have been um, uh, making clones of the browser, and then of course, uh, public projects as well. Um, and then now someone's even extending it to dogs. Uh, so, as I mentioned, we're shifting towards Nomad, this, uh, uh, the, a much larger data set, uh, double the number of exomes, but then also add on top of that 15,000 uh, genomes, full, whole genome sequences. Um, and what this really does is really creates a, a decent amount of challenges in the amount of data that, that can be served up. Um, the uh, MongoDB that we were using before actually turns, turns out to break so at around something like 3 billion entries, um, which is exactly the number of, you know, bases in the genome. So that's problematic. So we're shifting to Elasticsearch to, to get it a little bit more scalable. Um, and this is work that's being pioneered by Matt Solomonson and our group. Um, we are um, then present, are also providing the data as a uh, graphical API. Um, we can talk about the relative strengths and uh, uh, weaknesses of that approach, but it, uh, um, it's a, a nice little self-documenting um, um, API that individuals can use. And then from there, we're also building some component libraries. Uh, so um, at the moment, the browser is kind of a one behemoth of code. That is, uh, if you touch one thing, it might break something else. So we're uh, trying to make it a little bit more modular so that people can kind of clone bits and pieces of the browser and maybe use only certain things that they need for themselves. So maybe they don't need the coverage plot, but they'd rather have a Manhattan plot uh, for visualizing GWAS results. Um, so we're kind of allowing those kind of uh, um, plug and play uh, Approaches. Uh, so for one example of that, you might have, you might be interested in plotting your data along some uh, transcript track. Uh, when you click it open, it actually shows you the, the transcripts itself, um, just like you would have in like the UCSC genome browser. Um, and so just to show you what that'll look like all together, um, oh, I didn't realize that was animated. Excellent. Um, the, uh, uh, this is what the kind of Nomad Browser 2.0 that we're looking to release sometime in the next few months. Um, you could actually then have a much more dynamic view of the data uh, and really be able to kind of look around and um, do much faster searches and, um, and kind of interactively explore your data um, on top of that. Um, yeah, and also searches, yeah, searches that really uh, will not work at all, because right now it's actually somewhat difficult um, to allow for flexible searching uh, across these variants. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank all the people involved in this work, in particular my um, supervisor, Dana MacArthur, uh, and then Matt, Ben, and uh, Brett, who are in instrumental in creating this. And of course, the individuals who gave us the data. There's really um, not much we could have done without uh, all that data. So, thanks.